To be honest, most of the artists that made music at that time in the 80s didn't get no royalty checks. We never got a royalty check. So imagine Sugar Hill Records artists ain't getting royalty checks till recently. everybody to change another hip-hop guards podcast i'm the general sincere that's my partner uncle e and tonight we have the pleasure of speaking with donald d of the b-boys we'll be yes, joined sir. by brother b later on uh but until then uh donald d take us back a little bit in time and tell us where you were born and raised boogie down bronx man where hip-hop all started man uh bronx new york you know, growing up as a youth in, in the boogie down, having fun out in the streets, playing stickball, kickball, scalesy, you know, all them childhood games we played in the Bronx back then. You know, opening up the fire hydrant, shooting the water with the soda cans, you know, <laughs> living life in New York City. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, for a teenager, what were you witnessing as far as uh, the early developments of hip hop? Oh, first thing I seen was Cool Herc throw down at uh, junior high school 129. But I didn't know what it really was. It was not called hip hop at the time. All I knew, it was this big, gigantic guy out there in the schoolyard playing music and people dancing and a guy on the mic just shouting out people's names, man. So that was my first vision. But the first time I actually heard somebody saying rhymes on the mic, was at a Disco King Mario jam at 123 Park. I saw Busy B. Starsky get down. From that moment, I was like, you know, I had that fire me to want to be an MC up on that stage like like he was doing. Right. Hmm. But can you uh, go back a little bit to the Cool Herc uh, jam that you're talking about? You know, what, right. exactly, what exactly were you witnessing at these jams? What, what, was, what was taking place while they were on the turntables playing music? What kind of music was being played? I mean, well, it was basically music that I heard around my house, that music that my mom played on her stereo component or what they played on the radio. You know, it could be a James Brown song, Sly and the Family Stone, Temptations. Because, you know, I, we didn't know about any break beats. You know, we weren't focused even on just that break part in the records. We listened to the records from the beginning to the end. So that was basically how I remember hearing some of the records. It wasn't like what I heard later on when I went to a Grandmaster Flash jam to when I heard him cutting the break parts of the record. Mm, so okay, okay, all right. And then you said you um you had the Dis Disco King Mario, right? Yeah. You witnessed that. Can you talk a little bit about Disco King Mario? Um, give us a little breakdown as far as who he was and why is he not mentioned more often than he is? Oh man. I was I, I was mentioning this on my Facebook page about how he's so unsung and not really represented as one of the founding fathers of this culture. I mean, you know, they would talk about Bam, they talk about Flash and, and Hurt as the trio, but they leave out so many. But Mario played a big part. And, you know, I went to many of Mario jams, man, where he had it packed. And, you know... I don't understand how, how he's like one of the forgotten heroes of hip hop, but I'm happy that they acknowledged him recently. They got had a street named after him right, right, right. and his community. And I see now a lot more people are showing them love. I guess it, I mean, it seems like once somebody shows you love in one part, then everybody start opening up the door. I just recently saw the, the, the video that Russell Simmons posted up about um, DJ Hollywood, how he's being forgotten, and he played a big part. I was going to some of Hollywood parties at 371, and he inspired me, too, of him telling stories on the mic and just as a DJ that could rhyme. You know, it's crazy that 
he's not being acknowledged. And I say on that, that Yankee Stadium event, there's not enough Bronx people that built the foundation representing on it. It seemed like it's a money-making opportunity and they got people that had hot records or hit records and they kind of like got the pillars of hip-hop a little small part, but there was so many that played a big part in helping build the foundation and getting hip-hop stretched worldwide. So, you know, gotcha. we got to fight the powers that be. <laughs> Uh, before getting into MC and and and, and b boy and uh, who were some of your musical musical influences, Donald? Oh, well, what I heard around the household: The Temptations, Sam Cooke, uh, Parliament, Funkadelic, uh, James Brown. As a kid, my mom took my brother and I to the Apollo, and we saw James Brown live with The Temptations and Gene Knight on the same bill. It was incredible. Uh, me seeing Dennis Edwards was so inspiring of just how he was the leader of the group and he was just, you know, and even watching The Temptations, they set that foundation of early hip-hop of passing the mic around where everybody had a part in the song and then you wind up seeing how that evolved with The Furious Five in the beginning. So, yeah, that was the music, the soul music of uh, the 70s, Motown sound was what I heard around the house. Jackson 5 was the music of my youth. Right. Talk a little bit about uh, your earliest element of getting into hip hop. A lot of MCs would say they were graffiti artists, DJs. For Donald D, personally, what was your first uh, element uh, of getting into the culture? You know, I tried to get down on the floor and dance around, man, but it didn't last too long. I didn't see b boy as a future endeavor. And then I used to tag my my name around. Sometimes I used to write Don Juan or I write uh, Don Juan 180, but nothing major where I got and took it to the subway trains or, or painted big murals, you know, because once the MCN took part, all the other elements kind of faded away. Mm. Okay. And can you tell us a little bit about as far as, you know, you just mentioned the graph and dancing, but like what exactly did you witness coming up around that time, like, for example, with the B-Boys going to the jams, because I always hear the stories about before they really went down to the ground, it was more of the top rock. Um, right. Can you just tell us a little bit about that development that you saw from your perspective? Well, I didn't see the, the B-Boy -bo in part till I went to a Bronx River jam. Okay. And that's where I'm first seeing the Zulu Kings getting down. I couldn't remember all the who they were, but I'm pretty sure it probably was DST. So you see, in the Zulu Kings was my first witness of seeing B boys getting down and and doing moves that I never seen before. Okay, Zulu Kings. All right. Now at that particular time, are you anywhere involved with the Zulu Nation or thinking about joining the Zulu Nation, or did that nope. come much later? That comes much later. I was just a fan as a witness watching them guys get down on that small stage up in Bronx River Center, uh, seeing Pow Wow and Love Kid Hutch, Biggs, you know, right. even going to some of Africa Islam jams when they were called the Mayberry Crew. Mm. Just, you know, right, right, right. going around the Bronx, just trying to see whatever jam I could see. It was basically me and um, Easy AD, who, was, who became a member of the Cold Crush because we were childhood friends. And we were just floating around, going to jams. Mm. Yo, what, what part of the Bronx exactly were you from? From the South Bronx. So I grew up in an area called Lambert Houses um, that was near East Tremont, right near the main entrance of the Bronx Zoo, which okay. wound up having some legendary hip-hop people growing up in that same complex as Raheem from the Furious, Shah Rock from the Funky Four, um, you had Tony Tone from the Cold Crush, the original Spinderella. Right down the street, you had LaVon, who later became a member of Grandmaster Flash mm -hmm. um, group. We had some basketball guys that played at St. John's, Billy Goodwin, my man Ronnie Ryan. So many. Okay. Some other legendary groups, um, the Eminem crew, DJ Cool Joe. So it was a lot of artists growing up in that same uh, complex. Also, Members of the uh, R&B group GQ. 
Okay. So yeah. Okay. So the reason why I, the reason why I was asking because you mentioned going to the different parts like Bronxdale and all that, and I know early on back in the days, sometimes you know you had to kind of be careful depending on what part of town you were from. Right. Yeah. So, so you, I mean, I had no you problem because you were walking around kind of freely. Yeah, those were in walking distance. Bronx River was right not far, and then Bronxdale is not far from Bronx River. But then you got to remember. So now this is. The gangs are over with, so it has transferred. So as a younger guy, yeah, the gangs was, was crazy up in the Bronx, whether it was the Peacemakers or, mm -hmm. or you know, or the Savage Skulls and, you know. Don't forget, their, don't, don't forget the Italians, man, in, in Little Italy. You know what yeah, I mean? Right? You, couldn't, you couldn't walk down that street without them chasing you. You know, even up, that, right. Or even up by your by your street, be with the chingalings, man. Right, so yeah. it was crazy, but we were young where we didn't have to be part of that. Okay. So we were lucky. Got you. Got you. <laughs> Brother B, before meeting Donald D, talk a little bit about your journey uh, into hip hop. What was your first uh, element? You know, like I was telling Donald, a lot of MCs would say they were graffiti artists, DJs. For Brother B, personally, uh, what was your first uh, element in hip hop? Um, well, my first, well, my introduction to hip hop was just seeing how this, this. It, I mean, it was, it was just, uh, it was just a surprise to me that. I didn't know that people had that kind of talent to rap on the mic and break dance. I was I wasn't a break dancer. I was more of a cartoon artist, you know what I mean? And um just seeing the guys in the park with you know DJing and rapping on the mic was something that I fell in love with. So I started, you know, writing rhymes and stuff like that. So I was never really a part of the element. I introduced myself to the element. You know what I mean? Um, there was a moment where I said, well, if I had a chance to get on the mic, what would I say? So Busy B, I would go to all the parties, T-Connection, the Fever, all these different places that I really wasn't supposed to be in because I was young. And so Busy B saw me in 129 and he was like, he stopped the, D stopped the DJ from playing the music and he was like, um, Yo, this little guy is everywhere, man. Like, I know he, he's just straight hip hop to me right now, you know? And so he was like, yo, is, what do you like about the, the game? So, yo, I want to be a rapper. So he gave me the mic. He said, all right, little man, do your thing. And, you know, I, I, I said a couple of bars. And from that point, I never put the mic down. You know what I mean? And, you know, so my journey through the beginning of hip hop for me and coming this far and joining up with Donald D and becoming the B-Boys, um, that was just the beginning of everything, you, you, you know? And so, um, yeah, man, that's where my journey started. You know what I mean? And and see, you that's funny. That's funny because his whole vision also was Busy B, just like me. The first so, MC we got to see. Now, you were, you in, were you in any groups, Brother B, before meeting Donald D? No, I, well... I joined up with the with the Imperial Brothers, but before the Imperial Brothers, I was always by myself. I was trying to form a group, but the guys wasn't too serious. So I I was introduced to Imperial Brothers, and I got down with them, and that was short lived. Um, at that time, it was everybody wanted to be the head honcho, and I just felt better being by myself. So I just so. So I stayed by myself. So what ended up happening was the Cold Crush did a show at the boys club. So they had a little intermission. And Kaz looked down at me and Donna was like, yo, man, why don't y'all come up here and, you know, hold it down you know, you know, until our intermission is over. You know, and when me and Donna got on the stage, man, like it was really a good turnout. You know, Donald looked at me and said, yo, maybe one day we'll make a record together. And so I was working at a job down in Manhattan and my boss came to me and he said, dude, you, you got a phone call. And I was like, well, I'm busy right now. Who would be calling me at my job? So I never answered the phone when I did answer the phone. Cause he threatened me. He said, dude, if you don't answer the phone, I'm a fire you because <laughs> it's a record company. I said, what a record company. I never, you know, I never 
contacted a record company or none of that. So when I got on the phone, it was Vincent Davis of Entertainment Records. He said, listen, your boy Donald D referred you to me. Yeah. And um, and I just want I want to know if you are, you know, are you willing to be a part of a group to make records? And I was like, hold on a minute. And I just turned to the side and looked at my boss and they got him. This got to be a joke. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I said, this got to be a joke, man, because I was like, this can't be happening right now. So I get on the phone and I'm talking to him. He said, listen, I need you to come down to my office. I need to, I want to audition you. So my boss, my boss was standing. He was like, nah, he can't leave the job. He has too much work to do. So <laughs> Vince was like, so, so my boss said, well, you think it'd be okay if he do it over the speakerphone? So Vince was like, yeah. So I was rhyming. So my boss was like, wait a minute, I, I got to see this and I have to get everybody else to witness this. So he got the whole staff. <laughs> so they put me on the speakerphone and I'm just rhyming and rhyming. Vince was like, yo, I can I can use you. Yeah, you and Donald, y'all going to be a team. And so my boss was like, yo, what did you just do? Like, what, what was all these words like? He was just rhyming like some type of rhythm. Yeah, yeah some, some type of rhythm poetry. And you hear people in the background like, yeah, that's that thing them guys, them kids do out in the park with the turntables. And, the, you know, <laughs> it was just really funny to me because they knew nothing about it yeah. at all. And so that's how the B-Boys actually became the B-Boys because Donald was like, yo, one day we may make a record. I didn't know it was coming like that. You know what I mean? Right. Because I, you know, I'm working my job. I'm surprised, and you know, we went forward with it, and so we came up with the first song. I think the first song was "Girls." No, 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 but, hold on, no, no but, but there's a story before you come into the picture, right? Okay. The so the first song is actually two, three break, and then rock the house. Is all how the foundation of it started to, to cut and Herbie, to Chuck Chill out leaving the group, then me adding another MC named the original Mark, who was also from Lambert Houses, to him getting kicked out of the group to Brother B coming into the picture. So that's mm -hmm. how it goes. <laughs> right, right. No, no, I, I'm glad you corrected that because when I came into the group, I didn't think about that part of the beginning. You know what I mean? Because for me, I was too excited to. I mean, I was right. like, you know, this is a start for me. And I was just moving forward from that point of the Donald D calling Vince and, and letting Vince know that he got somebody else that would, you know, would probably be interested. Mm -hmm. But moving yeah. on with that, moving on with that. And I'm glad Donald said what he said, because now when we made this, when we made stick up, kids, OK, it was good. It was I like what we was doing. But when we came to Millie doing the, the girls, Vince had a bunch of girls come to the house. And these girls, actually, some of their names were in the record. So I started it off, and then Donald, he jumped in it, and it just kept on rolling and rolling. And that's how we created girls. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, so, so, so. Yeah, that was yeah, that was just the beginning of everything that's going on right now. Got you, got you. So, brother B, I just wanted to say, so you kind of auditioned and performed all at the same time that day. Pretty, pretty much, <laughs> pretty, pretty much. But it was um, a good feeling. It really was a good feeling because, like I said, I wasn't known out in the street as that dude, that rapper dude, this guy that could turn out a party. Like my name wasn't circulating like that. And so when I did it in front of total, well, I wouldn't say strangers because they were my co-workers. When I did it in front of them, it was definitely like fireworks. Like it was like, yo, this was my test, my moment. Let me deliver. And I delivered, you know. And so. Gotcha. See, I didn't have to audition. Me on the radio station was my audition for Vince. He came down to the radio station that we had or the radio show we did on Zulu Beats. And that's mm -hmm. how. Okay. I got into the B boys, and I know, I know you, I know you asked Donald something about Zulus and all of that, and I, and, um, uh, and I heard somebody say, "Well, asking me uh, what was my elements of hip hop." Well, mm -hmm. 
going back to that, I was a I was a Zulu member. I was a Zulu member of Chapter Four. Okay. You know, uh, yeah, because I just wanted to be part of getting into the to the to the community center, watching Bam. You know, do his thing on the turntables and all of that. You know, and so yeah, just going back to you guys mentioning about Zoo, I was a member of Chapter Four back in the day. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Now, I was I was uh, briefly part of the Long Island chapter of Zoo, not that long, okay. ago, right, right before everything happened. With, with, oh uh, yeah, okay. yeah, right, 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 um, right, right. So yeah, 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 yeah. So Donald, do me a favor though, because we kind of right. like you, you know, you mentioned about like certain members that was in the group before Brother B. Um, but there's two things I want to ask you. First is, can you let us know more or less exactly how that started as far as the group? Because I know Chuck Chilla was down, and I think right. for a lot of people, it seemed like it was you, Brother B, and Chuck Chilla, like that was the main group for a while. No, nah, um, the main so group break, was to break that right. down a little bit. So the main group was me and Chuck in the beginning, okay. but how all this evolved, it goes even before that with me with Africa Islam, then and me with Easy AD. So it starts with me and Easy AD. The hip hop journey starts with him as a group called the Asalam Brothers, okay, with DJ Rashid. So that's how we start, but the group doesn't last long enough, and we go try out for Africa Islam's group called the funk machine which it was him dj superman and dj jazzy j and he had already two mcs kid vicious and lj so they had me and easy ad basically try out for the group they liked me they didn't really like ad but i tried to leave with ad and ad just basically said ah right, you know you that's a known group get down with them I always say, if I left out that door and walked with AD, I would have became a member of the Cold Crush. Mm. You know, that would have changed okay. my hip hop history journey. You know, I don't get down with Islam. I guess I never meet Ice T. But right. that's another story. So I went from being on the other side of the rope, going to Bronx River Center, now to being on stage with Love Kid Hudge, Lisa Lee, Pow Wow, Globe, Biggs, mm. you know. Okay. I was nervous. The first jam I did with them, I was scared when Pow Wow passed me the mic. Mm. <laughs> I was terrified, man. But once he gave me the mic and I just said one, two, two, and I heard Smitty with the echo had it, I felt right at home and said my first rhyme with these guys and the rest was history. So from us doing the radio station, so we had a radio show called The Zulu Beat, right. Africa Islam, DJ Red Alert, and I was the MC that rhymed live over the air while Islam played the beatbox. So Vincent Davis from the record company would listen to the show and heard me rhyming, and he came down to the station and basically asked me that I want to make a record. But I thought he was wanted to do it with me and Africa Islam. But he said, no, nah, I have this idea of this group called the B-Boys. I have this DJ named Chuck Chillout because I had never heard of Chuck Chillout. Um, and so the rest was history. Went in the studio and did those first three records. So time we got to making girls, Chuck Chillout had already left the group, went mm -hmm. solo and started doing his own thing, okay. putting out records on Entertainment. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh what about entertainment uh, was so appealing as far as uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, record labels in the early 80s. So what was it about that label uh, that you guys felt comfortable to sign over there? Well, I wasn't I wasn't thinking about entertainment. I wanted to sign with Celluloid Records. I had a conversation with the legendary graffiti artist Phase 2 at the Roxy's. And he had had a song called The Roxy's. So I was asking him, how did he get to make a record? Because before then, you already, you know, you had Flash and them had made records. They was on Enjoy. Then they went to Sugar Hill. And, you know, I, you know, the Funky Four. So I knew people that had already made records. And he told me I had to talk to DST because I had loved the sound that was coming out of So You Like, whether it was Fat Five Freddy, Change the Beat, the stuff that DST had, Bam had Time Zone, the Wild Style. So, I talked, went to DST, and he basically said if I was going to make a record with him, I had to wait two years. Oh. He's like, yo, you're going to be on a two-year wait. So Ven Ven Ventertainment beat him to the punch. 
you know, so I was going to probably wait the two years out. And so when Vince came up to the station, he took me in the studio and I had no clue of how to make a record because he was telling me to write my lyrics in bars. And I had no concept of what that was. Because when we rhymed back then, we had 32 lines of rhymes. You know how we rhymed back then till right, we passed right. the mic to the other MC. So he basically broke it down to me listening to a Temptation song saying you hear eight bars of them singing the verse and then there's eight bars of the chorus. And that's how I based it around writing the full song of Rock the House. And that's how it started. Uh, brother, brother B, before uh, cutting the record with uh, Donald D, did you have anything materialized on wax or was your first appearance? No. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't. I didn't have anything materialized on wax at all. My my dream though was just to get on a record. Um, Donald made that happen, and but before before then, I had four best friends that I hung out with every day, and what we was doing actually was like whenever anybody threw a, a neighborhood jam, community jam, we kind of bum rushed the party. Basically, they made sure that my homeboy, which is me, get on the microphone and show them how it's really done. And, and and I was really successful with that because other rappers, you know, they would write, they would write a few bars, you know, then it, it, then it goes into like this meaningless, it's just, just making noise now. Yes, well, yes, y'all, to the beat, y'all. Right. Yeah, it was all of that. It was like a little bit of bars and a lot of yes, yes, y'all, right? <laughs> well, my my thing back then was I was a storyteller. Like, I could sit in the park if I see two girls fighting and they turned around and jumped this old man and the police came and chased them in the building. I, I wrote, you know, sto uh, raps like that. So basically, I would go to these different projects and we'll just hang around, you know, uh, drink a few 40s and all of that. And my boys, they would always say, man, it's time for you to get on the mic, man. They ain't saying nothing. I said, <laughs> yeah, I'm get high. So it was like, how am I going to get on the mic, man? This is, this, I don't know these guys. So I, I had a friend named Pokey. Like, this dude was like, he was definitely a, a party crasher. Like, he didn't care. Said, listen, DJ, my man, yo, turn that off for a minute, man. Yo, my man right here. Yo, y'all need to put him on the mic, man. I'm telling you what I'm telling you. This dude will definitely get it popping. And I used to look at him like, oh, why you always put me on the spot? Because you're good and I want you to do your thing. And basically, I would just go to all these projects, all the parties, and just get on bum rush the mic and do my thing, man. And I was a, and I was a hit, to be honest with you. But my name didn't flow around the mainstreamers like the Cold Crush Brothers, Flash, mm -hmm. you know, my name wasn't rolling in, in that circle, at, you know, at the time. But for what I was doing, I was proud of what I was doing. So I just kept doing what I was doing until I met up with Donald. And the funny thing, meeting up with Donald, we all we went to the same neighborhood boys club. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sort of like we all grew up in a boys club. And yeah. I never, I never met him in the boys' club like that because we always play intramural basketball, you know, different sports in there, you know, and, and stuff like that. Until the music really, you know, took a whole different turn is when I started seeing Donald, and that's when we was able to look at each other just and say, "Yo, maybe one day, man, we can do something together, man," and and. Basically, that's just how it went, you know. So, so before that, no, I never been on, never had nothing materialized on wax at all. Let me, and I may say something because Brother B said, speaking of funny, I'm gonna tell you all the funny story of how when I first saw, when I told you I first saw Busy B Starsky. So, when I see Busy B rhyming, he's the first MC I saw saying rhymes on a beat that rhyme. I remember running to the local bodega. I got it because back then they gave you a paper bag. Like you had to put your beer in a bag and you walked around in a paper bag. I asked the guy, can I have a bag? I asked him, can he give me a pencil? And I wrote down everything I heard Busy B saying. Because back then, MCs ain't really had a lot of rhymes. So Busy B kind of repeated 
a lot of his rhymes, especially the flow like a butterfly, sting like a bee, got more rhymes than Muhammad Ali. I wrote down all of that. When we did our first jam as the Arsalan Brothers, we did it in an abandoned building in the Bronx where we had the DJ set in one room and the people dancing in another room. So I'm back there rhyming Busy B rhymes off the paper. Nobody can see me. <laughs> but then a guy came back there and said, yo, you biting. You're saying Busy B rhymes. Ooh. <laughs> and I was like, wow. So that's when I first went and wrote my first rhyme, which was the dip dies, recreate, not MC that I am a tape rhymes. So to fast forward to another jam, we was going to do a jam New Year's Eve at the, the, the club called The Black Door, which later became the Dixie Club that you all mm -hmm. see in the movie Wild Style. Okay. So the Arsalan brother, we give out the flyers. We're doing this big New Year's Eve jam at the club. All of a sudden, the manager of Grandmaster Flash, Ray, talked to the owner and got us kicked out of the club, and they put Grandmaster Flash and the Furious in there. Hmm. So we were pissed, or we were mad. Let me say we were mad. <laughs> <laughs> so me and Easy AD were standing, at, standing in front of the ropes watching them do the jam, and we were thinking all those people, because we gave out all the flyers, and they didn't give out no flyers. But we knew they were a bigger group than us. So we was like, did all these people come see an owl flyer or was it just word of mouth? But <laughs> that night, I got the education of a lifetime because that was the first time I saw The Furious. And I got to witness and see what all of, the, all of the, what they all did. So I got to see how Kid Creole rocked the Echo with the Echo switch. Solid go, go, go. Mm. I got to see how Cowboy rocked the crowd, throw your hands in the air. I saw how Melly Mel put words together in different syllables. And I got to see how um, Mr. Ness was just so cool on, on the stage. So we didn't do the jam, but that was very educational for me that night, man. So that's that, that they played a big part. And when B Brother B mentioned about telling stories, the first story rhyme I heard was Cowboy say that story about the mouse that lived on the hill, which later on I had wrote a, a rhyme on Ice T song where I talked about a mouse in the house, and that was inspired from Cowboy's rhyme. Mm. So, Dope. and Cash yeah. also influenced me with telling stories. He used to have a rhyme about Jaws, and I used to be like, "Damn, yeah, telling the story was really really cool." So when I was on the Zulu B show. I had like a story rhyme that me and Eddie Murphy was hanging out. I had one about me and Liza Minnelli. I wrote a rhyme about me and Bruce Lee telling the story about Bruce Lee. So I always was into telling the story. So to when you fast forward to when I got with the syndicate, telling stories like car chase, who got the gun and things like that. So I always love telling the story. Hmm. So you, you mentioned just now a few, you know, you mentioned Kaz and Busy B and all these different uh, MCs of that time. Right. Um, and you said that they inspired you. But who would you say you inspired you as far as how to write your rhymes? Like, meaning, like you said, there wasn't a lot of rhymes, really, because it's early on. So right. where did you, you know, where did you come up with, like, okay, I'm going to rhyme like this or in this type of cadence or... You know, was there any particular person that influenced you for that? Nah, I had no blueprint. I mean, I just listened to what they said on tape. I mean, listening to the Funky Four tapes when Raheem was with them, him and Shaw and KK and Keith Keith. You know, I had a lot of inspiration to hear, but then I just thought of my own way. I said, okay, I, I, I didn't think, like, I got to sound like Melly Mel or Pow Wow. Right. I just started writing whatever I wrote. Because you think at that time, I'm writing rhymes without music. Right, right, right. I didn't have nobody giving me beats. or I mean, not beats. Well, cutting up break beats on to give me a cassette and say, okay, go home and write rhymes at that time. I was writing rock without music and then fitting my rhymes onto the beats. So that's how it started. Hey, you know, that, that's a good question that you asked, Donald. Because my favorite rapper of all time, Believe it or not, it's Grandmaster Cass. And also, and I have to put Melly Mel. And I'll put Melly Mel in that because okay. the way they would come across with their lyrics 
it's how I started to write my lyrics. Like, okay. not a copycat, not biting and using their words. It was just a style. Mm -hmm. Like, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like a high, low cadence. It was like straightforward to the point. You you know what I mean? And and because I remember doing, I remember doing again. Uh, 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 crashing another community party and Grandmaster Kaz happened to be there and Kaz got on the mic after I was done he said yo this guy reminds me of myself the way you know the way he rhymes you know and I was really proud to hear that because this was coming from one of the higher ups in the game you know what I mean so yeah yeah. Um, for me it was Kaz and, and Melly Mel like I definitely I would run. I mean, listen, if I knew that these guys was in the park, then I would run into the yeah. park just to just to hear these guys do what they do. Because my thing was, I had my boom box. I always kept a boom box radio. So with having a boom box radio, parties that I couldn't go to, I always had the tape. For some reason, I was able to get the tape, even if I paid $5 for it, I got yeah. it. You know what I mean? So I would sit around the park, walk around the neighborhood, banging the, the boom box. And again, my favorite rappers was The Flash, The Cold Crush, Fantastic, Crash Crew. Uh, you know, who else? Uh, like guys like Pooba, um, you know, Funky Four. Yeah, so, you know, and, you know, that first generation is so important for me. Like I tell guys today, I said, listen, I know you want to get in the game until you go back into the history of the game. You would find it a lot easier to make it in the game because mm. you got to give the respect to those who started this game and see a lot of young kids are lacking in that department right now because when you ask them who's your old school rapper, they'll tell you 50 cent. <laughs> you, right, you, right, right. You, 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 you know what I'm saying? And I don't think that's cool for them to make that kind of remark because again, this game is this game is serious, man. It's like when it first came out for me, when I first and I'm gonna tell you how I saw it. Grandmaster Cash known as Casanova Fly, he was a DJ. Mm -hmm. He walked down the street, he had two rec two vinyls in his hand, and he had a crowd of people walking behind him like the pipe piper. And I was like, yo, what's going on, man? What, what, what are these guys getting ready to do? So I got behind the crowd and followed them into the park of 129. Grandmaster Cass put the, the vinyls on the turntables and started cutting it up, and the whole park just lit up. And that's the first time I experienced hip-hop. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's but crazy. you know what's crazy? So he's talking about Kaz, but Kaz gets down with our crew with the funk machine. So for me, that was a dream come true of like being in the presence of Kaz back then. He made me step up my rhyme writing because Kaz to me was so advanced. So we had Kid Vicious, who was a dope MC in our group. And we had LJ, but when Kaz got down with us, when we were called we were called the three the hard way MCs, and then we changed to the Imperial Four. So Kaz is down, and, and he's saying all of these rhymes. Kaz is just very tricky with his words. Y'all know how Kaz, right, right. Kaz, he's still great to this day. But back then, damn, so that, actually those tapes are online. I'm, I'm pretty sure Geechee Dan got them, or Troy L. Smith got those tapes with, with some of them jams with us, man. And Kaz passing me the mic, and... For me, I was like, man, this is a dream come true. Kaz passed me the mic and I'm rhyming. Or when Pow Wow passing me the mic, th that 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 was surreal at that time. Cause I used to sneak out of my my apartment to go watch these guys. I used to sneak into the T connection to watch them. And now I'm on now, the same stage with them. And it was just like unreal at that time. What what what's Just, the time what's the timeline though? You saying that Kaz got down with with you know the crew that you were in? Is so this that's pre, like before Cold that, Crush? Like yeah, this is before Cold Crush. Before well, Cold Kaz Crush. was like a gypsy MC. He was traveling because <laughs> I mean he had already did the Notorious <laughs> Two with him and JDL. Because if you go back to the early Cold Crush, that's Whipping Dot with Easy AD and think right. T Bone. 
So Cass was just traveling again down with different crews at that time. Yeah, so that because was seventy nine. I want to say I think nineteen seventy nine because I started with AD in seventy eight. So yeah, yeah, because because I I, I know Cass is casting over fly the DJ, and right. then when I saw him with Co Crush, let me tell you something. And I'll tell anybody this, like when they have these verses and all of that, and I don't care what nobody say. If you want some, if you want a group, because you know how you hear the Migos talking about they're the greatest rap group of all time, and I beg to differ. I mean, listen here, I would fight Mike Tyson to prove to everybody <laughs> that they are wrong for saying that. Because at the end of the day, Cold Crush. They were the ultimate supreme rap group, along with the along with Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Like these guys, these guys knew how to work the stage. The 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 they, they had the routines lyrically. They had the dance steps. They were very photo energetic guys. The ideas they came to the stage with the machine guns and in 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 white suits and yeah, I mean uh, these dudes was 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 phenomenal, man. Like. Like you would uh, listen, I'm gonna tell you right, I would quit my job to go see them in concert if my boss told me I couldn't go. <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? Because because when you when you went to see these guys, yo, you was totally entertained. I mean, totally, totally entertained. Like you can come home. Yeah, you can come home, wake up. Call your homeboy, yo. You should have been there last night. Yeah, I was with my girlfriend. Man, the hell with her. You should have been there. Cause I can't tell you in so many words how how banging and slamming that the show was, man. It was if you missed it, you was wrong for missing it. And you know what? That's what is a lost art, the routines, man. I used to love so back then when I'm in the funk machine, we had routines. That was what it was all about. You know, the fantastic routine, Funky Four routines, Crash Crew, the Force MCs. So the routines played a big part in that early, you know, decade of hip hop, man, of the MCs, the groups, man. So when I went solo, I always missed just being interacting on stage with MCs as the routines, man. That's why on our new music that we got, me and Brother B are taking it back to the art of routines, man. Yeah, and you know, I, I wanted to say this. To, yeah, I, I wanted to say this to you guys. So when we, when we, the, when we, when this, when the B boys became like me and Donald now, after the beginning, we did this show in it was in Philly. Now we went around and we did shows here, the Fever, you know, Fun House, stuff like that, you know. And and I used to always say to Donald, man, yo, this is yo, this is a good thing, man. I I like I like the reaction I get from people and stuff. But we did this one particular show in Philly. And it was the night of the boys. I think it was Donald, it was the Boogie Boys and the Bad Boys. Yeah. So so because we got paid the less, we had to perform first. And you know, they was making fun of us. Yeah, you guys get on first, man. You know, whatever, whatever. I said, all right, cool. So me and Donald came up with an idea. I said, yo, you know what? Let's go in the crowd. So when they announce us, and we're going to hesitate. So when they announce us, we're going to make them announce us again for the second time. So we got on the hoodies. We, we, we're like in, we're in the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, the B-boys. and them, So we kind of hesitated. So now the crowd is getting a little antsy, like, oh, yo, what's going on? Hey. Yo, ladies and gentlemen, the B-Boy. So we came out of the crowd. And when I tell you that building exploded. Yeah, everybody <laughs> was looking. They were looking at the stage. Right, thinking we right. coming out on stage, but we were in the crowd, walking from the crowd to the stage with the mics. They and went bananas. About, yo, let me tell you, they were pulling on our clothes. Security, it was like, yo, hold on, man. What's going on? And hey, nobody tell us about this. <laughs> and, and yeah, we, so, we bust them up that night right so we so we make it to the stage and then I, and so when we get on the stage you know everybody's just bugging like the place is lit it was like a a, a lower level balcony uh venue 
And so I remember looking at Donald and I said, yo, Donald, you know what? I, I heard heard uh, the rumors going around saying that you could, you know, you could rock a crowd better than me. <laughs> right? And I said, well, we're going to prove that right now. So I said, listen, we're going to go down the middle, split it right down the middle. I got this side, Donald, you take this side. By the time we was done doing that in our normal routine, on the microphone, never left alone, got more juice on Uncle Paul, I'm the brother B in the place, guaranteed, put a smile on your face. Here tonight to let you know my Zodiac signs are LEO, guarantee I steal your microphone <laughs> doing my show. <laughs> so one for the trouble, too, and I'm, when I tell you Mardi Gras came on, the the wall fell off the building. Yeah. Off the I building. Like <laughs> oh, so yeah, now yeah. when the so when the two groups get off the stage, but when the two groups get on stage after us, you know, the crowd was just sitting there with their hands on their face, like, <laughs> yeah, they did they're not doing so well after all. <laughs> but but after the show. The girls, man, dude, they chased us down the parking lot. They caught Donald, ripped up his leather yeah. jacket. And, yo, I jumped in the limo and locked the door on Donald like, yo, dude, you on your own, player. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> My outfit costs money. They ain't ripping this up, you know? <laughs> but I got out. I got out. And when they attacked me, I'm rolling around on the grass with this girl and this is another guy's this is another guy's girlfriend I'm like really is this happening right now i'm like wow i, I love this this is this yeah. is hip-hop this is hip-hop man you know what i'm saying right, right, yeah, I right never, yeah i'll never i'll never forget the night because when i was on stage the same guy was pulling my pants leg and he says yo my girlfriend wants you to give want me to give you her number <laughs> I said, what? So I took the number. This is the same girl I was rolling around in the grass with outside <laughs> after they chased her. I couldn't believe yeah, it. I said, yeah. so, the, so I said, you know why I love hip hop? Because you can get the girls. <laughs> well, back yeah, then. You, yeah, back then you can get the girls. I mean, not, I mean, back then, well, any era. I mean, right. had to, like know, if you put on, if you had put on a leather suit. <laughs> Oh, you had on the British. If you had the British walkers with the with the, with the Kango, the, right. the you know uh, the mock neck shirt. If you had remember now, gold was not it. Silver with the ruby, with the ruby stone and silver chains was was the jury. Right, if right, you right, was right. wearing, if if you was dressed like that, you had all the girls. If you had that microphone in your hand. That was amazing to me. I was yeah, like, that was, that was fun. That was a fun time in hip hop. Yeah, and the thing was, you didn't never see cups in nobody's hand. It was always a forty ounce and two and three girls on each side. Man, I said, yo, this got to be the bomb, bro. This, 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 this got to be it right here. You know what I'm saying? So that part of the element right. of hip hop, people don't talk about it because it's true. Like, yeah. Right, right, you right, got right, the right. girls, man. If you knew how to rhyme and you was the main person, you know, the main rapper on, at, at a show, man, dude, you walked out with like a hundred women, man. You know, it's funny because a lot of, I I hear that a lot, like whether it comes from, from you know, B-boys, breakers and stuff like that, a lot of them will say, yo, I used to dress the way I dress to get the girls. I used to practice and do my dances because the girls were attracted to it. So it seemed like the girls played a big part in the Development and, and expertise of hip hop. <laughs> yeah, over. dude, like but, you know, it was like I, a motivational. <clears throat> excuse me, it was very motivational. Right, right, right. Because you knew, yeah. like, just say if you had a job, you know, you got off of work, you got your hair cut, you had your fresh shell toes on. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, man, it was like, no, nah, I got to get to the show because I know Mildred going to be there. Alice going to be there. Oh, yeah, you had the dress fly. We yeah, was the fly you know, guy. You know, fly you know, guys, fly girls back then. Yeah, man. you know what I'm saying? So, so, and so the kids today, the kids today, they get that. I mean, should they get it more than what we was doing back then? But mm -hmm. is they're, they're just missing, they're missing the respect of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, a lot of respect came back in the day. Like you just couldn't do what you wanted to do with girls 
like that. You know what I'm saying? Like now, man, man, even the girls, they disrespect themselves the way they dress. Them girls wasn't dressing like that back in the day. You know, you know what I mean? So sometimes I got to remind them like, look, dude, go back. Go. Don't be afraid to go back to learn so you can move forward. It's OK. Right. So right, it's, right. it's OK, man. You know, hey, uh, Donald, real quick, you guys mentioned about the entertainment, right? But I right. Saw also, what was the deal with the street wave label that was out in UK? Was that around the same exact time or is that two, you know, two different times? No, Streetway was a company that also was Street Sound that was Morgan Kahn over there in the UK. He basically was licensing all of the music that was out in America at that time. But the crazy thing is the labels wasn't really telling a lot of the artists that the music was being licensed there. Yeah. We didn't know. Yeah. As the B-Boys, we didn't know. We yeah, didn't find we out. Didn't know. We didn't find out to 2011 of how big our music was in the European market. When we did their 25th anniversary, back in 86, they tried to book us in England, but the late, so basically the label didn't want us to know because that was a way of not us getting paid. Mm. To be honest, most of the artists that made music at that time in the 80s didn't get no royalty checks. We never got a royalty check. So imagine Sugar Hill Records artists ain't getting royalty checks to recently when they right, won their right, court right. case. Right, right. Enjoy. Think of all the labels back then from Tommy Boy to whatever, Tough City, because nobody knew the business. They weren't going to take time to teach us publishing and about how many points you get on the records. They weren't going to let us have our own management. I remember Venn Entertainment didn't want us to even talk to Russell Simmons. Russell, they wanted us to sign the Rush Management. Our song, Girls, was one of the hottest songs back then that Run DMC played on rotation, LL. Jalil used to tell me all these stories. Jalil from Houdini, he said when they were out on the Fresh Fest tour, which we thought we were going to be on those, on those tours, but the label shot that down, whether it was us or at that time also Joe Ski Love. So, yeah, it, it was crazy that, you know, the music was licensed throughout the world and we never saw a penny of it. Yeah, and you know, you know, you know also what was crazy about that too? Because when Donald started telling me and I started looking up stuff and I'm like saying, wait a minute, man. We got we got like uh they had like they started putting together little packages, B boy tracks, like you know, uh and, and selling them off for seventy five bucks a pop all across Europe. And all of this, and I'm like saying, hold on, how come, how come B boys ain't getting no kind of money out out of this situation? And I just thought it was, you know, it was very discouraging to me, to be honest with you. Like, you know, when you sign, when you deal with people and they talking to you face to face, like my dad always just say, a man is a man if he keeps his word. You know what I'm saying? And even though you sign a contract, your word is still honorable as well. Um, it, it, you know, the, what really opened my eyes when I did my first gig out in Europe, me and Donald, and this young guy came up to me and was like, yo, man, your music changed my life. And the dude cried on my shoulder, man. And, and, and I was like, I didn't know we made an impact like that overseas yeah. at all. You know, another guy yeah. was crippled. Another guy was crippled. His wife had just passed away. She had died with uh, with twins that he was raising. And that yeah. man told me, that man told me, he said, I did everything possible to find a babysitter because when I knew that the B-Boys was coming, I had to be there. Like, dude, I never heard stories from the other side of the world. Like, again, never knew we made an impact like that because Vince kept us out of the, out of that loop. Yeah, you, you, so, you know what I'm saying? So basically, 2011 was the first time we performed as the group in Europe. With the, with me, wow. him, and Chuck Chill out was the first time they got to see all three of us on stage together. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, it yeah. makes sense because, you know, how would you guys know if the label didn't tell you? There was no way of gauging, no. you know. Right, right, right now right. that you have Instagram and everything, you can see what right. you're doing. That's nuts. Man. Exactly. Yeah, and if you think, yo, Entertainment had a nice roster of artists, whether it was us, 
They had Joe Ski. They had Dougie Fresh. They had Keith Sweat, Chuck Red Alert, um, In Touch. Right, right. So they had a nice roster, but, you know, the label was selfish and destroyed the legacy of that label, man. So, wow. hey, it is what it is. Right. Ain't no reunion parties with that label because none of the artists were ever accepted. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> You you talked a little bit about uh, creating five songs uh, in the early uh, days. Uh, what song would you say got you guys the most uh, traction? Back when we was in the B Boys. Yes. Girls. Girls. Yeah, that was it. Well, girls. Rock that. Rock the house. I look at Rock the House at two three break. Did good. It was like became some of the most sample parts in music history. Whether they re sampled the the two, three break, or they recorded, I mean, sample my voice, rock the house, y'all. They've been sampled so many times. But girls, when we did that, influenced so many artists to rhyme in that style. I just listened to a song that somebody sent me where DMX had a song where he was talking about all these different girls. Even LL did a version called After School, him and P. Diddy. It's been so many. I know Prince Paul redid Girls. Uh, the original Gun Clap is part of Boot, boot Camp Clip. Wind up doing so many did a style of Girls. Even the intro that Brother B was saying where Brand Newbie and sampled that as a chorus on their song, on their album. So many people sampled our music and, and, and was influenced by what we did as the B-Boys, man. And I, but let me tell you, let me tell you this too. Whenever I get an opportunity to do a, a performance or uh, and I notice no matter where I've been, the minute I say I know a girl named Millie, you know, the, the crowd just start they just they know the lyrics. That's just how this that record was so so impactful to the point where like it makes you feel it always made me feel good because I start off the record with I know a girl named Millie. And, the, and you can hear them like you can hear it in between. Yo, that's the yo, that's the dude from the people. Oh man, yo, we um, like where these guys been and now you know. So yeah, that record that record was powerful. And and I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna really say this, and I don't want y'all to hold it against me. But I always hate the beat. Oh wait a minute, I was just gonna. I wanted to say who did the beat. Yeah. Vince, right, so we had a we had a producer named Guy Vaughn. He kind of produced a lot of the the music, but the beat was something that Vincent Davis, the owner, was telling this guy what to put because we didn't like it because we were rhyming over a kick and a hi hat, and we basically wanted to rhyme off the part that was in the chorus. So to us, but then Vince's vision was he thought the lyrics was crazy. He wanted the people to focus on our lyrics. So that's how that worked. But till when we did part two, we hated it even worse because we was like, we doing the same beat. So right, right. Yeah, we hated it. But it worked. It wound up working, though. So Yeah, it ended up, it ended up working. <laughs> My point of why I said I hate the beat, because if, 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 if slapping a person wasn't violent, you, you, you know what I'm saying? I, I just hate that beat. Like, really? Yeah, really. Even to this day, uh, I mean, all these years, I still don't like the beat. You, you know, it's too wide open. You know what I mean? It has room to add melody and stuff to it and all of that, where the lyrics will still come across. I just hate that beat, man. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So, you know, if I could have handcuffed them to a tree, pour honey <laughs> on them, and let the bees get them, <laughs> yeah, that would have happened too. You know what I'm saying? I just don't like the beat. Yeah. You Moment know? Momentarily. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, because I'm just saying there's something I get what you got what both of you are saying as far as the beat goes. Like when you really start to think about it now, you know right. what I mean? For me right. looking back, I get it. But at that time, there was something about that beat that made it sound so distinct and apart from whatever was out there. All the other beats. It, yeah, you know it did. I mean? It did. It stood out. I think it that was stood out. part of what grabbed us, you know what I mean? Like, right. I mean, yeah. Because it was so, but yeah, because it stood out. It was told it could be. I, I think from all the other music that was coming out back then, everything was moving fast. Right. That particular beat when it came out, it was more slow than more laid back, and it was like boom, boom, do 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 do. It was that sound. 
it was different from all. Too, though, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. It, yeah. Time, right, right, exactly, exactly, exactly. Back yeah. then, I used to imagine if we had our lyrics say we did it on the Boogie Boys Fly Girl track. Now, we had that track to that. That song would have been even bigger. Got you. Yeah, okay, okay. Or say we doing it on the show right. track. Okay. That's how I envisioned I Vince was going to have it where it was like danceable, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which he didn't see that. But he made that up with Joe Ski Loves. Of our, us complaining, he corrected it on Joe Ski Loves song. Pee Wee Herman. Yep. Got you. But see, another thing, too, with the Joe Ski Love era that really upset me, really, was the fact that, okay, we're all label mates. And we kind of, you know, even though they had two, three break and rock the house, y'all, and all of that, and just to show the impact of girls, kind of put Vintertainment Records uh, above water. Like, you know, you can you can see the company is getting ready to rise, and then all of a sudden, when he worked with Joe Ski Love, then you put the B Boys on the back burn. You know what I'm saying? Like. It wasn't like a team effort, like, okay, I got you guys and I got Joe Ski and both records are good. You know what I'm saying? Even though his was hotter than us because, okay, it was a different style and everything like that. But the way he put us on the back burn, then it was, then he gave us, gave me, I, I spoke to Vince myself. Well, I need you and Donald to come in and do, do an album. So when I mentioned what's with the contract to the album, uh, don't worry about that right now. If y'all don't do the album, y'all can't go on the Run DMC MC tour to God. And I'm like, hold on, wait a minute. What you mean? So you don't think doing a contract for the album is important as well as doing a show or doing the, the, the gig at Master Square Garden with Run DMC? I, I'm, I'm not understanding where you're going with that. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Like when now we become optional to doing a contract, if not, we can't do the show. You know, right? And I, and at that point, to me, I think that's when the whole B boys fell apart because Donald had already went to California at nah, that time. I was, I was still in New York at that time. Oh, we were still, okay. we were supposed to do the album, but when he yeah, wasn't talking I, contract, we was like, we ain't recording without no contract, man. Yeah, you, you know, know that was it. Yeah, and, that then, was and then once Pee Wee Dance took off. I guess there was no need to focus on doing an album with us. Okay. That was that was my next question. What eventually happened to you guys after 85? So due to contractual disagreements, is that where uh, the B-Boys kind of go their separate ways? Yeah. And then basically, yeah, pretty much. for some stupid reason, he played that I was still on the contract because I was trying to record songs with as the Zulu Kings – I don't know if you ever heard the songs that they did with Ice and Kaz and Mel and Bronx Style Bob and Islam on Spring Records. So I'm missing on on them songs. Uh, so I wind up going in the studio because I'm 86. I meet Bronx Style Bob. So we start working together. And then we wrote a song for Nightmare on Elm Street for Dream Warriors. And we were in the studio working with the Bon Jovi band. And they loved the song. The movie, people loved the song, but they wanted a bigger name, so the Fat Boys wound up recording our song. So I guess I became one of the first ghost writers of a song outside of Kaz writing Hank's parts on Rapper's Delight. So that's what I was doing up to 87. Then I got with a label called Rockin' Hard Records out of Jersey that also had YZ. I did a song called Outlaw. Um, dope jam, and then after that, the rest was history. I was in LA, man. Right. So, at what point do you guys? So, there's about a 30 plus year gap from then until your recent music. At what point do you guys get together and start discussing uh, releasing new music, getting back together as the B Boys? I think it started back in 2000. It started Nine. in 2009 because yeah. no, I no, moved no. to. No, yeah, 2000, it, when you was in L.A. with me. All oh, right, 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 in right, 2000. right, right, right. Because I went to see, I went to visit Donald in, in L.A. And yeah. we started recording, we started recording again. Um, 
and you know some some things some op certain obstacles got in the way where okay you know what we're gonna have to put it on hold and you know and so i left la and came back to new york then i ended up moving to south carolina and and, and then I it go, was like I right, go to then, italy. right donald moved and moved donald moved to italy and so 2000, I think it was, yeah, 2009, early 2009, I spoke to Donald and I was like, yo, what you think about, you know, doing the, you know, doing the B-Boys again? He said, hey, man, we could do that. So I flew out to Italy and we recorded a whole bunch of different stuff, you know, laid down a lot of vocals yeah. and that's, that's pretty much what's going to be coming out now. Um, all that stuff that we did and you know all we did was just revamp you know now yep. with technology you can take vocals and you know throw them on different music now you know so that's basically now because we, we we i mean we recorded like probably two albums worth of stuff you, you know yep. yeah you know so so that's the stuff that we uh, donald did you send them any of the new music at all Nah, I could get it to them though. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get it. Let us I'll get them the new music. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so so yeah, we we yeah, it was two thousand nine when I called Donald. I spoke to him and about getting the group back because I know the LA thing, some things got in the way and so we put that on hold, but we've been working at it, you know what I mean? Because now you remember back in the day, even with all the other groups or R and B groups and stuff. You could put a song out and that hit record could last a year, six months to a year. Now you put a hit record out, man, it lasts, what, two months? <laughs> and, and, and less, and, and less now. So, so every time we, every time we worked on the, on the music, it was like, man, now nah, we need, we need something else, man, because it's, it's, it's just going out of date so fast. You know what I mean? Like, and so, um, so we just continuously just keep flipping and keep changing and flipping. And so I think we will, I think where we at right now, I think we're comfortable with what we got right now, just to reintroduce the, right. the B boys back on the scene. I think, I think we're good right now, you know, but you know, we even have ideas for the second album. So, yeah. but we need, yeah. So we need to, yeah, we need to get this one out first. And, and that way, and you you Good. got you guys were right. able to still use the name. There's no yeah. issues, no issues with the. Uh, no, no, you know, no, no, no. We can. Use, we don't care. Yeah. I mean, Vince came up with the name, but what he gonna say? He unjerked us for a lot of money. So what? He gonna come at us and what? Sue us now? Right, right, right. No, no, yeah. I'm it. like, man, we and then all we, the right after 30 years, all the rights go back to the artists anyway. Hmm. And if you, you think about it, that. and if if you think about it. He can't sue us because you got B-Boys, Breakers. Right. So that, that name, so that, everyone used that name. <laughs> so so the right. B-Boy name, you can't even copyright that. Right. You, 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 you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so we're going to keep that name, whether he <laughs> like it or not. It doesn't even matter. You know what I'm saying? Now, when you write that check, yeah, I could change the name. Until then, <laughs> we're going to always be the B-Boys, man, no matter what. Yes, sir. Right. And see, the good yeah. thing now, we you know we've been working with Chuck D on with his label. We've been releasing our music. And, you know, now we got some upcoming shows. So we kind of reintroducing ourselves to the American audience where we got a few shows. This Sunday, we're going to do the show in Brooklyn on the, on the Coney Island thing. Yeah, I don't mean to you, but that, that, that sounds kind of crazy, man. Reintroduce yourselves to the American you know, you would think you could right. say like, yo, you know, the European, Europe, right, like right. right, because Europe, Europe, the guys from the Bronx got to reintroduce themselves to, yeah. right, right, man, That's because, it, it, right. because, because no, I, I mean, remember I understand what you're saying, but it just sounds crazy. Because in Europe, Europe, hold on, B, let me say this first. It's strange because this is the 50 year celebration of hip hop, right. and it's been going on since January, and they've been picking and choosing who's been getting celebrated, and it's been basically the same ones. And they're leaving a lot of people out, especially a lot from the first 10 years of, of of the culture. So I was, like, trying to fit in, like, yo, contact the people. Yo, how can I get down with this? So 
I had a conversation with Ice T and Islam. They was like, man, forget about trying to fit in, man. You a legend, man. Do what you do. So I told B, man, all right, we got to do, first of all, let's put a flyer out that we are available for gigs. Right. We got to start hitting social media hard. Okay, we have a flyer. Contact us, blah, blah, blah. And then gigs started slowly but surely coming about. Basically, uh, the show that we're doing in Brooklyn was already put together, but I had spoke to Ed when I saw them getting inducted in the museum in D.C. about some things, and he said, okay, yo, man, I know that, you know, the show is already closed, but I'm going to see if I can get y'all at it. Because I said, yo, we just need to get back out there so people can see us. And from there, you know, things started popping off. You know, I'm going to be at the Rap Mania one, on the 11th, then we got the Lambert thing. And then we on the Art of Rap with Benny Siegel and, and Mint Bleak, you know. Nice. So, and that's good too, because we get to go back to Philly since when we did the shows back in 85, when we did the show with Schooly D during the okay. B Boys when Girls came out. So, right. you know. So, and then with the new mean? music, then with the new music that we, we've been releasing maxi singles, we had the first one called, um, what you gonna do? And now we got this one called We're the Two MC that's out, and then we're gonna follow with the album called We Get Down. We got a nice song that features Ice T and Chuck D on one of the tracks with us, man. That's really Don't dope. Don't forget this is for the pioneers. Yeah, we got yeah, this is for the fine pioneers. We got a lot of good joints, man. Cause I see a lot of people from our era ain't really making current music. Mm-hmm. There's probably a handful of them, like Imperial Brothers, I know, still are making current music. I see my man Peso still be making music. So there's some people out there still recording. And, you know, because I love making new music, man, just to keep, you know, the fire burning, man. So what you guys may not know is that me and Uncle E was in the crowd during Bushwick uh, Collective concert where Ice-T performed and yeah. got to see oh, you Oh, y'all out there? Oh, we yeah, was out yeah, there. Man. How, how was that feeling uh, of uh, performing for that crowd? Go ahead, B. You can tell them. Uh, uh, well, you know, me me personally, I live for all performances, man. Any chance, any chance and any opportunity I can get, I'm willing to get out there and 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 do do what it is I like to do. Um, I wish we, I wish we, I wish that it was not only just the Ice Chief set. I, I I wish it was what the B Boys could have done with our set, like the whole introduction routine and how we do it. Um, but you know, it, I, I was definitely grateful to, to grace the stage with Ice T. You know, that was my first time ever gracing the stage with Ice T. And I, I thought that was honorable. And I and I thank him so much for having me or and Donald come out on the set and perform. So it was definitely a good thing, you know. Yeah, because yeah, because originally we were gonna take it back to the syndicate mm -hmm. through some of the songs like that. But then I was more pushing like, yo, I'm trying to get the B boys thing popping. And then Ice came up with the idea, okay, well, I'm going to have y'all do your joint. I'm going to bring Tretch. He do his. Keith does his. He's going to bring Smooth and Trigger out. And that's how that all came about. And it worked. But it introduced us back to the public of seeing us for the first time in years, especially in America. Right. So it was a good look. So, you know, uh, Sunday is the next the, the next installment. Nice. Well, I won't. I won't. I won't be able to make that show. You know, I, I have some personal things going on where I'm at. So Donald has to go and represent for the B boys, and I know he's going to do a good job because that's just how we do it. You know what I'm saying? So right. you know, I just yeah. want to say, man, that seeing you guys that day in the at the Brooklyn Collective, because like Donald, you know, you you kind of stayed like you know people get to see you sometimes here and there, and you you right your face. But I didn't expect to see Brother B coming out. You know what I mean? I kind of <laughs> right. saw Donald like in the cut and everything. You know, I recognize, man, when you guys came out on stage though and performed that song, I was a little kid again, man. <laughs> right, right. I was so well, happy to see you guys rocking together, man. I, well, I, I feel good. Some footage of I, this. So I, I, uh, I thank you guys, you know, because you know, know who was excited? I just, just want to say that 
there's a lot of us, you know what I mean, like my age group and all of that, that came up on, you know, like music that you guys put out that, right. you know, we're still around. Like, we still want to see you guys perform and we still want to come out and support and enjoy. Right. Like you said, Donald, it's like you have to unfortunately reintroduce yourselves and yeah, try to bogart your way into some of these events and stuff you know right yeah you gotta do that man it's a shame that the people that are out there that are putting these events together don't even have the mentality to think about like hey let's reach out to these guys and these guys it's like yeah because there's so many people missing out of a lot of these events yeah and i'm glad you said that because i was just telling donald i think it was like a month ago you know they got all these uh legendary tours uh pioneer tour and it's the same artist every tour every year back to back like they don't reach out to nobody else you know what i'm saying and then you know because donald does a lot of work other than just laying down the music you know he's sitting behind the desk and reaching out and you know a lot of them you know one thing i hate the most is somebody blow smoke in your face with a big smile you know what I'm saying? Because, dude, if it's not going to happen, say it, it's not going to happen. You right. know what I mean? Because it's always, oh, yeah, man, the next time we do an event, I'm going to put you guys on it. And, and But it's the same. And right. the same people that they're using, they're not even got, they don't have no new music at all. Mm. You, you, you know what I'm saying? And you would think with a group that got new music, at least give them a shot to see, you know, if they still belong. You know what I mean? And so that, you know, and I, I talk to Donald about that all the time. Like, they just use the same artist every time with no new music. Oh, that's you know? like I said, we, we talked about the Russell Simmons thing, but he had to go onto social media to, you know, to let these people know Hollywood was irrelevant. Y'all, how y'all doing this big event in New York and y'all ain't got him on it, right. you know? But I see how who they got live nation is running it mm -hmm. and they trying to make that bag right but i don't think it's gonna hurt them having snoop and little wayne who have more of the new york foundation that jump started all of this without us there's none of them this right. doesn't travel to them and right. you think a lot of us new yorkers set the foundation of bringing it to california when we all moved there we changed that whole landscape of especially L.A. hip hop, where we took what we were doing in the Bronx and the Roxies and shaped L.A. a different way when we first got to L.A. Right. So it's a shame that, you know, not so many of, of the early day pioneers and legends is not involved in such a monumental event. So well, but that's what happens when we leave it in the hands of people that not truly part of the culture. Mm -hmm. I always said, man, an event like that in Yankee Stadium should have been us putting that on. We should have been the promoters. Flash, Herc, you know, Zulu, whoever. Because what we did back in the day, we were our own promoters for our parties. We didn't rely on, on people to give us a budget and book us in these shows. We did these jams ourselves. We probably didn't get paid enough money after we made enough money to go eat white castle after the jam but we were happy <laughs> we were happy and i think a lot of us we got spoiled and just been waiting for somebody to offer us to put us on and i said man you know we got to take the initiative regardless i know probably in the beginning like people ain't trying to probably want to pay us for a lot of gigs but i said in the long run it's going to be better because you know you, you know you just got to grind and do your own thing, man. You can't with your, have with your hand out saying, put me on. Even though a lot of these guys that's doing the events, we may know them, but I said, man, it's every man for themselves, man. Ain't nobody looking to help you shine now. Mm. They don't care if it's 50 years of hip hop. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So, well, brother, brother B, Donald D, we want to thank you for everything that you contributed to the culture. We are so happy you guys are back. The new album, We Get Down, is out soon. Can you tell the fans what to expect and when to expect that project? Well, right now, we got the maxi single that's out right now. And they can go to all online stores and download it. It's the B-Boys with the two MCs. We're trying to finish this album. 
I kind of been going through some personal things, but we're going to get it done. Uh, that we get down so that we can get it out there, the full album, get some videos out there. So that's coming real soon. Hmm. Any possibility of vinyl coming out? Like any, any press? Oh, yeah, it's going to be vinyl. We're going to surprise right. the people with some unexpected stuff that's going to be on vinyl and then the new album. Nice, thanks. So on behalf of myself and the general sincere and changing of the hip hop guys, we appreciate everything you guys have done and contributed to this culture, man, that we call hip hop. Um, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be able to talk to both of you gentlemen. Yeah. Together. Yeah. You know what I mean? So right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And, and, and you know, send us that music so we can check it out. And, yeah, and, yeah. and when you're ready to put it out, let us know so that we can help blast that too. Okay. Yeah, Donald, Donald, you heard right. that? Yeah. Yeah. I heard him. Uh, Cause right now, right. um, Hip Hop Guards has got it on their playlist. So it's starting to circulate because I had to register a song before I could send it out to the DJs that's playing it on internet radio. So it's all good now. I'll get it to you. I'll send it. I'll send you the link to your email. Okay. Okay. Appreciate that. Fellas, man. All right. Have a great one. Gotcha. Thank you. Yo. Have a good night. Peace. Peace.